gifted individuals that are going to show you their excellent abilities today. And we're going to start off with Brian McCullough. Brian, are you ready to get started here? Okay. Well, Brian, as you know, has been in the adult choir for about 20 years. And he's a member of the Gospeliers and the Praise Band here at the church. But he is also, you may not know this, he's also going to be performing in the He's Alive, our performance at the Capitol Music Hall on April the 3rd. And he is going to be starring as one of the disciples this year. So they brought him out of the background and put him in the forefront. So Brian's going to be performing Love is Like a River today. Thanks, Jimmy. Hit it, Maestro. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
And she just kind of fell in love with it, so now she just can't stop. Um, I can't tell you how many plastic containers we have around the house full of stars and pot holders and all that. So if you have some time, maybe take a walk past her table later and see what she what she has going on back there. You want to say anything, Em? Yeah, I'm addictive. You're addictive? Addictive or addictive? <laughs> Right. 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 The scars are $10 and the pot holders are $2. Well, we didn't come intending to sell them, but you know. <laughs> <Not that. laughs> okay, our next, um, our next talent is going to be Jim Stoltz. But I guess he has a hobby to display more so than talent. Jim, would you like to come up here and talk so you have a microphone? I, I'd like to. Can you hear me back there? Yes. <laughs> I'd like to stay here because I want to show you some things. Okay. Uh, I collect what's called coastal history. And maybe some of you have been stamp collectors during your lifetime. And I collect stamps too, but my major emphasis is coastal history. What that is, that is mail that's been delivered to the mail system. And it covers all kinds of topics. And it represents the history of the country. As an example, I've got some letters here. Here's one from March 15, 1828 in Wheeling, Virginia. And it talks about the death of a family member. But the thing that you'll notice when you come up later and like to look at the material is beautiful writing. Uh, we have no idea. I'm a terrible writer. I print everything. But the writing skills that a lot of folks had in the last previous two centuries is extraordinary. But these were all kept by a family member for whatever reason, probably because of the historical significance of the importance of the family. I have a letter here, this is dated 1848, and it's from the Cockaine family to a, a, a party in Wheeling, Virginia. The Cockaine, the Cockaine Farmstead in Glendale is an early settler 
developed into a full form, but it's a letter talking about a man wanting to marry this woman. So you have that kind of thing here in the history of, of life as we know it going forward. If you had interest in naval history, maybe you're a Navy veteran, or just had an interest, there were two ships named after Wheeling. One was a gunboat, the uh, USS Wheeling, that served back early part of the last century. And what I have, of course, is a picture of the boat and its history, but also I have cards from ship members that were sent to various locations throughout the country, including one that shows part of the crew. And so again, you get the sense of human life communicating at that time. Now almost everybody in here uses some kind of electronic technical media, technical <coughs> emailing, messaging, that kind of thing, uh, Facebook. In those days, it was all done, obviously writing it out and sending it to the mail. So some other examples of things I have, the USS West Virginia, which was sunk at Pearl Harbor, I have quite a number of covers for men that were on the West Virginia prior to the sinking, and then also after the sinking. And in fact, the way the ship was even rebuilt pre, was shown on a postcard, pre Pearl Harbor, and then after Pearl Harbor. But in addition to that, there was an earlier USS West Virginia, which was an armored cruiser that served back in the first part of the 20th century. And then right now, on active duty in the Navy, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, there's a submarine, the USS West Virginia, that's currently um, in place. And I have from there covers from the, the ship itself with the ship's postmark, which is part of this collection. And I have just a couple other quick things to show you. Uh, this is a cover, I have some covers on various aspects of wars that the country's been involved in. And this is a, a cover sent to a Confederate medical officer, a doctor, from a Confederate Army hospital. And the cover, this interesting thing about it, on the back side of it, if you'll notice it's paper, you may not be able to see it very well there from lines. But what happened, this represents the fact that the Confederacy was so short of paper that they, they took other pieces of paper, wallpaper, they took old forms and stuff like that and cut it up and made envelopes out of it, which is what this is. This was a form used by the Confederacy in some county office and later was part of it, so instead of throwing away, they cut it up and made it into a uh, envelope. Mentioning war type things, uh, this is, I was trying to hop about this a little earlier, the first Navy vessel actually sunk by the Japanese was the USS Penny in 1937 on the Yangtze River in China. This is a cover from that ship prior to the sea. And uh, it's only significant because it was later, a year after this was sent, was sunk by the Japanese. It did represent the first uh, real act of aggression by the Japanese against the American Navy. The Japanese paid us a great sum of money for its sinking and apologized. But a lot of the historians believe it was delivered in an attempt to try to embarrass the United States. One other letter from uh, War Material I wanted to show you. This is one that I just picked up last year. And by the way, these are not expensive items. It's just a matter of searching them uh, for them. You can buy them and go to a stamp show or that kind of place and get this kind of material up. This one, though, in, in many ways, is one that uh, I really treasure. And I don't know this family, but they live in Wheaton, Illinois. And this letter is dated April the 13th, 1942. And it was sent to a private, William L. Denton, and uh, care of his unit, uh, Postmaster San Francisco. The reason I got this was that it said, uh, return to sender service suspended, Philippines. And this was a young man that went over in the Air Force, uh, Army Air Corps, and went to the Philippines, his whole unit, and there were over a thousand men, and they were in the Philippines and Japanese attacked in December of 1941. The planes had not yet arrived. The unit was going to serve. So they ended up taking these men and putting them into uh, Army infantry units to help defend the Philippines against the Japanese. Well, unfortunately, as some of you are certainly aware, uh, the American forces there had to surrender. And the Italian, the Italian death march occurred, a number died in captivity and so forth. But this letter is sent by this boy's father. His, his son was named Bill. And he sent this very, very beautiful letter talking about, I hope you're doing well, we haven't heard from you, I understand things aren't going well, but I know you'll be safe and so forth. And so it came back to this envelope. So it was kept by the family apparently until family members died. 
But the sad thing about this is he never returned. His son never came back. Uh, he was killed in captivity by the Japanese. They didn't return to the state. So I, I like to think the reason this was kept was because it was the last letter that the father had ever sent to his son, even though it was not received by the son. Came back and it was a family heirloom, and uh, uh, I, I intend to make sure that this ultimately goes someplace that somebody will keep it because I think it has great significance. Another area of postal history I, I collect are railroad post office cancellations. One time we only had a number of passenger trains that went through the city. And they used to have, this is a little H.O. Gage uh, railroad post office car, but they used to cancel the mail on uh, trains between different locations. And what these are, I have here the last, uh, this is the last railroad uh, passenger service out of Wheeling, and it's a cover was canceled at that time in 1961. It was a train that ran from Wheeling to Chicago. And if you can look up from the cancel, it says Wheeling in Chicago. Uh, the last train that left Wheeling. And this was the last train that ran through Moundsville, uh, where Charlene, where we live. And uh, that was a train that went from uh, Wheeling uh, uh, to uh, Rafi. And uh, it was the last fast train, and that was October 1957. And it's signed by all the members of the crew that, that, that were on the train at the time. And uh, it's just the last of that. And finally, uh, two other just quick things here. This is a cover of Wheeling, Marietta, and Parkersburg. Before the rail line was built from Wheeling South to Parkersburg North, into Huntington, mail was carried on riverboats. So this is a, a letter from uh, that was on a riverboat canceled on the Wheeling Parkersburg uh, was sent down by a uh, uh, riverboat uh, service. And then this, I also collect Methodist to philately or Methodist related covers and material. For example, here are just some examples of that. We have a cover from uh, the Bicentennial of Francis Asbury's arrival of Philadelphia. Now these aren't old, but they celebrated that event with the postmark from where that event had occurred. Now here's one, some of these are worldwide in, in nature. Here's one from uh, Methodist Conference in uh, New Humberside Hall, England. Uh, here's the bicentenary of the first visit of John Wesley to the Isle of Man with the stamps uh, from the Isle of Man here centered in the dated 1977 October. Wesley had visited there at the same date in 1777. And uh, here's another one, just an example. This is from a Methodist church in Kenmore, New York, that's celebrating its 50th anniversary. And finally, on Inauguration Day on the January the 20th, 1993, uh, a special cover was issued honoring Hillary Bill Fenton uh, by the Methodist Philatelic Society because Hillary Fenton is a member of the United Methodist Church. So that's that's what I collect, and that just give you an idea of what's up here. As I said afterwards, I'd like to talk about anything. Next, we have a very young, uh, talented individual, Colin Jones. He's going to come up here and perform for us. He's going to be doing some aerobatics, gymnastics, and dance. Uh, he's been taking classes for two and a half years with the aerial left. So, take it away, Colin. <laughs> Yeah. 
Discovering a telephone. <laughs> yes, this is my talent. Oh, <laughs> 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 
um, I'm just without words. <laughs> he thought he was going to want to crack up. Oh my gosh. Wow. This is what I live with. <laughs> young person in the church, so I'm going to talk about her her hobby or talent, that's Chelsea Fulmer. Uh, Chelsea has been on the archery team at Bridge Street for three years, and she travels on Saturdays to tournaments throughout West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. Chelsea, do you want someone to stand against the wall with an apple on their head? <laughs> that you can go back and um, and she can talk to you about what she what she loves about the sport. Alright. Alright, next we have Wayne McCord. Wayne is in the house. Wayne's a lifelong member of the Elm Grove United Methodist Church, our choir groups, he's um, in the praise band and the Amen Players. So what are you going to be doing for us today, Wayne? WSC Field always said, never follow or work with children or animals. <laughs> I'm going to add Martians to that list. <laughs> It's on. All right. We're going to have a little story time. This is a story that I was first introduced to many, 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 many years ago back in the Dark Ages when I was over at Bridge Street. So that tells you how long ago it was. This story is entitled The Night the Bed Fell by James Thurber. I suppose that the high watermark of my youth in Columbus, Ohio was the night the bed fell on my father. <laughs> it makes a better recites recitation, unless as some of my friends have said one has heard it five or six times, than it does a piece of writing. For it is almost necessary to throw furniture around, shake doors, and bark like a dog to lend to the proper atmosphere for what is admittedly a somewhat incredible tale. Still, it did take place. It happened then that my father had decided to sleep in the attic one night to be away where he could think. My mother opposed the notion strongly because, she said, the old wooden bed up there was unsafe. It was wobbly, and the heavy headboard would crash down on father's head in case the bed fell and kill him. There was no dissuading him, however, and at a quarter past ten, he closed the attic door behind him and went up the narrow, twisting stairs. We later heard ominous creaking as he crawled into bed. Grandfather, who usually slept in the attic bed when he was with us, had disappeared some days before. On these occasions, he was usually gone six or eight days and returned growling and out of temper with the news that the Federal Union was run by a passel of blockheads and that the Army of the Potomac didn't have any more chance than the fiddlers. But you catch the drift. <laughs> we had visiting us at the time a very nervous first cousin of mine named Briggs Beale, who believed that he was likely to cease breathing when he was asleep. It was his feeling that if he were not awakened every hour during the night, he might die of suffocation. He had been accustomed to setting an alarm clock to ring at intervals until morning. But I persuaded him to abandon this. He slept in my room, and I told him that I was such a light sleeper, if anybody quit breathing in the same room with me, I would wake instantly. 
he tested me the first night, which I had suspected he would, by holding his breath, after my regular breathing had convinced him that I was asleep. I was not asleep, however, and, uh, uh, and he, uh, 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 I was not asleep, I was not asleep, however, and called to him. This seemed to ease his fears a little, but he took the precaution of putting a glass of spirits of camphor on a little table at the head of his bed. In case I didn't arouse him until he was almost gone, he would sniff the camphor a powerful reviver. Briggs was not the only member of the family who had his eccentricities. Old Aunt Clarissa Beale, who could whistle like a man with two fingers in her mouth, <laughs> suffered under the premonition that she was destined to die on South High Street because she had been born on South High Street and married on South High Street. Then there was Aunt Sarah Shove, who never went to bed at night without the fear that a burglar was going to get in and blow chloroform under her door through a tube. <laughs> to avert this calamity, for there was greater dread in anesthetic than of losing her household goods, she always piled her money, silverware, and other valuables in a neat stack just outside her bedroom with a note reading, this is all I have. Please take it and do not use your chloroform, as this is all I have. <laughs> Aunt Gracie Shove also had a burglar phobia, but she met it with more fortitude. She was confident that burglars had been getting into her house every night for 40 years. The fact that she never missed anything was to her no proof of the contrary. She always claimed that she scared them off before they could take anything by throwing shoes down the hallway. <laughs> when she went to bed, she piled, where she could get to them handily, all the shoes that were about the house. Five minutes after she would turn off the light, she would sit up in bed and say, Hark! Her husband, who had learned to ignore the whole situation as long ago as 1903, would, not, would neither be sound asleep or pretend to be sound asleep. In either case, he would not respond to her tugging and pulling, so that presently she would arise, tiptoe to the door, open it slightly, and heave a shoe down the hall in one direction, and its mate down the hall in the other direction. Some nights she threw them all, some nights only a couple of pairs. But I'm, I'm straying from the remarkable incident that took place during the night that the bed fell on Father. By midnight, we were all in bed. The layout of the rooms and the disposition of their occupants is important to understanding of what later occurred. In the front room upstairs, just under Father's attic bedroom, were my mother and my brother Herman, who sometimes sang in his sleep, usually marching through Georgia or onward Christian soldiers. Briggs, Beale, and myself were in a room adjoining this one. My brother Roy was in a room across the hall from ours. Our bull terrier Rex slept in the hall. My bed was an iron cot, one of those affairs which are made wide enough to sleep on comfortably only by putting up flat with the middle section the two sides which ordinarily hang down like the sideboards of a drop leaf table. When these sides are up, it's perilous to roll too far towards the edge, for then the cot is likely to tip completely over, bringing the whole bed down on top of one with a tremendous banging crash. This, in fact, is precisely what happened. About two o'clock in the morning, it was my mother who, in recalling the scene later, first referred to it as the night the bed fell on your father. Always a deep sleeper, slow to arouse, I had lied to Briggs. I was at first unconscious of what had happened, with the iron cot rolled me onto the floor and toppled over on me. It left me still warmly bundled up and unhurt, for the bed rested above me like a canopy. Hence, I did not wake up, only reached the edge of consciousness 
and went back. The racket, however, instantly awakened my mother in the next room, who came to the immediate conclusion that her worst dread was realized. The big wooden bed upstairs had fallen on father. She therefore screamed, let's go to your poor father. It was this shout, rather than the noise of my cot falling, that awakened my brother Herman in the same room with mother. He thought that mother had become, for no apparent reason, hysterical. You're all right, mama, he shouted, trying to calm her. They exchanged shout for shout for perhaps 10 seconds. Let's go to your poor father. You're all right. They woke up Briggs. By this time, I was conscious of what was going on in a vague way, but did not yet realize that I was under my bed instead of on it. Briggs, awakening in the midst of loud shouts of fear and apprehension, came to the quick conclusion that he was suffocating and that we were all trying to bring him out. With a low moan, he grasped the glass of camp, grasped the glass of camphor at the head of the bed, and instead of sniffing it, poured it all over himself. <laughs> the room reeked of camphor. <laughs> <laughs> Choked Briggs. <laughs> like a drowning man, for he had almost succeeded in stopping his breath under the deluge of pungent spirits. He leapt out of bed and groped towards the open window, but came against one that was closed. With his hand, he beat at the glass, and I could hear it crash and tinkle in the alleyway below. It was at this junction that I, in trying to get up, had the uncanny sensation of feeling my bed above me. Foggy with sleep, I now suspected in my turn that the whole uproar was being made in a frantic endeavor to extricate me from what must be an unheard of and perilous situation. And get me out of here, I bawled, get me out! I think I had the nightmarish belief that I was entombed in a mine. <laughs> gasped Briggs, floundering in his camphor. By this time, my mother, still shouting, pursued by Herman, still shouting, was trying to open the door to the attic in order to get up and get my father's body out of the wreckage. The door was stuck, however, and would not yield. Her frantic pulls on it only added to the general banging and confusion. Roy and the dog were now up, the one shouting questions, the other barking. Father, farthest away and soundest sleeper of all, had by this time been awakened by the battering on the attic door. He decided that the house was on fire. <laughs> I'm coming! I'm coming! he wailed in a slow, sleepy voice. It took him many minutes to regain full consciousness. My mother, still believing he was caught under the bed, detected in his, I'm coming, the mournful resignated note of one who is preparing to meet his maker. He's dying, she shouted. I'm all right, Briggs yelled to reassure her. I'm all right. He still believed that this was his own closeness to death that was worrying mother. I found at last the light switch in my room, unlocked the door, and Briggs and I joined the others at the attic door. The dog, who never did like Briggs, jumped for him, assuming that he was the culprit and whatever was going on. And Roy had to throw Rex and hold him. We could hear Father crawling out of bed upstairs. Roy pulled the attic door open with a mighty jerk, and Father came down the stairs, sleepy and irritable, but safe and sound. My mother began to weep when she saw him. Rex began to howl. What in the name of God is going on here? Asked father. The situation was finally put together like a big jigsaw puzzle. Father caught a cold from prowling around in his bare feet, but there were no other bad results. I'm glad, said mother, who always looked on the bright side of things, that your grandfather wasn't here. <laughs> Thank you.
Wayne. All right, another young person with a talent. We have Evelyn in the back of the room. And Evelyn is a, a tap dancer, as well as, well, she does tumbling, I guess, and ballet. She's been taking all kinds of different classes. And she's used to a much bigger stage, but she would be happy to demonstrate for you if you would like to see her do some tap. Evelyn, do you want to do it for everybody right now? Okay. My husband has a talent, I don't know if you'd call it a talent or a hobby, and he was a little bashful about putting it on a card or anything, but he is very, very good at online shopping. <laughs> That's a superpower. That's a talent. <laughs> That's a very good talent. It's a little hard to demonstrate that, but... All right. Now we have his brother, Todd who's going to share, share a very special hobby that he has with all of us. Todd, you want the microphone? Or? Okay. This isn't a talent. It's a, it's a passion. I have loved cars since I was... My mother said when I could start clocking, that's when I exhibited my passion for cars. My dad was not a car aficionado. He would drive his car until something broke, and then he'd go get it fixed. I learned nothing from him other than to maintain your vehicle. So, <laughs> um, but I've got two cars up here. There's plastic and then there's die cast, which are metal. So when I started out, it was buying cars in boxes about this size. That you would have plastic bodies, the chassis and floor, and the tires, and then all the chrome pieces. And then you would have instructions that would tell you what the part was. And then you would, ultimately I got wise and got exacto knives so I could trim them off very precisely. And that's how I learned about parts. What a brake was, manifolds, exhaust pipes, and so forth. So, Tim, I don't know, how old was I when I had that table down in the basement? Remember that? Three? Oh, I <laughs> <laughs> so I would do that for hours over the summertime. And I had, I don't know how many model cars I built. My dad put shelves up in my room to kind of, you put the, uh, the strips on the wall and then you have the brackets and then you set the shelf on the bracket. I even built a race car hauler. And I got so crazy, taken away with it one time that I was actually buying little pieces of aluminum tubing and making the brake lines, and I would use sewing thread to do the spark plugs and the wires. And I had a spring behind the accelerator pedal. I mean, I just was really geeking out on this stuff. And I was pretty proud of these. And one day, the shelf on the top oh, came down, no. and it took all the other parts of it. Oh. And all the cars, there were three or four that were rescued, were just in pieces on the, on the ground. So I kind of stopped doing it for a while. <laughs> <laughs> was that when you started to cause Yeah. I'm still crying. So I learned to and I actually built a little hot rod from out of the time. That was crappy, which I thought was pretty cool. But then later on, I got into uh, building some of the die cast, which I found more challenging because that's more like a real car. But Matt and I, we built a, we did a Ford pickup truck. And so I thought it'd be cool to build a model replica of that, which is what this is. And the problem was that in the uh, 1977 model year, I could not find a model that had the right back or bed for it. Because Ford had the same beds from 1956 for the step side clear through to 1980. And so what I did is I bought a 1979 Ford truck kit and then I bought a 1956 Ford model kit. 
and then I swapped the parts out to get what I wanted. So that took a little bit of time in, in, in engineering to make that work. This is a Model A that I built because our father had a Model A. It was his first car. And the humorous thing I remember him talking about was that he put a set of horns, dual horns on it, but they drew so much amperage that if he had the headlights on at the same time, it would blow you up. He said at night was kind of a problem. Do I turn the lights off or run the horns or what do I do? <laughs> so, you and my dad could understand the humor of that because he thought that was really common. But this was the first metal one that I built. And I actually rigged up the front wheel so that the steering wheel would turn with the, uh, with the uh, front end. And then you paint it like an, a real car. You have to prime it, sand it, paint it, and clear coat it. So that was what I did there. Other cars I like because not only the design, but there are historical issues to them. This is a Mercedes 300 SL Gullwing, made that because of the doors, the way they lift up. So it became an iconic design. It wasn't that they designed the car to have those kind of doors to start with. This was designed to be a race car originally. And they wanted a real stiff but lightweight chassis, so the sides of the frame were very thick. So a conventional door would not have worked because it would have reduced the rigidity. So after they determined how high that had to be, then they came up with the idea of the gullwing doors. So if you ever see a 300 SL with gullwing, you'll know why the doors came about. But the, the letters SL in German translate to super light in English. So that's what that designation was. And then the other cars, I have about 40 of them, so I'm going to bring all of them. But this car, is a uh, Shelby Cobra Daytona. So this was the second car that Carol Shelby became famous for after the original Cobra. And this was developed because the Cobra, which was a car without a top, was aerodynamically limited to 150 mile an hour. And so it couldn't compete at the higher speed tracks. So Peter Brock designed this on a map, and it was very aerodynamically efficient. And they were actually very successfully campaigning this car when Carroll Shelby got called by Ford Motor Company to help them get involved with the team to beat Ferrari. And then you've seen the recent movie, Ford versus Ferrari. The team that built this is who ultimately made the Ford GT40 successful. And so that's a, that's a pretty cool thing. The reason it's still in the box is because I have run out of Curio cabinet space and display these things. <laughs> you know, I've taken another break, so I'm, you know the kids are all out of the house now. I don't know if I can go off of another room, but I need some other display. If you no. <laughs> 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 shut down. I thought, you know, if I did it in front of the church. Yeah. <laughs> I hear you, bro. I got see Katie was not a dancer while I'm sitting here. Very, very quickly. Um, these are not expensive. They, you can spend anywhere from 20 bucks to, you know, several thousand if you want to get into the upper end, which I haven't done. Um, but if you would do that, um, so collectors would say you don't take them out of the box. You leave them in there. I did not have that. With it. I want to touch it, I want to handle it, I want to look at it from the different perspectives. So when I'm gone and kids want to throw them in the garbage can, it's not going to be an issue. So, right. So my my taste has run more toward the uh, Sports car side. I have some American classics. I've got a couple of Packards. Um, I have a Cadillac. That thing. These are 118 scale. These, these are 125 typically in the plastic, so they're a little smaller. <coughs> but the 118, I have uh, a Cadillac that was brought out right before the Depression. It has a 16 cylinder engine, and they call it the Twin Eight. And and that thing is about that big. I mean, that thing is just massive. Gutenberg's, um, 
are just incredible cars in scale in, in relationship to what we drive today. And I, I look at that twin eight engine, which is two eight cylinders they made in parallel in Germany to make a V16. Um, it's just incredible. At that time, Cadillac literally was, there was nothing better in the world. So it's, it's interesting to look at them in their historical perspective and relationship to what we have now. I'm not a enthusiast. I don't have any SUVs in my collection. Sorry, I know most of us drive SUVs now. Um, and I'm not an electric car fan. I love the sound of the internal combustion engine with the right exhaust. I don't care if it's four cylinder, six cylinder, V8 or whatever. Going to a uh, to a racetrack and hearing a Ferrari at full full tilt to me is that's a melody. It, that's a that's a song that I, a tune that I enjoy here. So it's it's uh, it's something I can do at my pace and it's been on and off again for most of my life. So if you have any questions about these individually, let me know afterwards. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we have one final act. We'll call it the grand finale. <laughs> I'm sure you've all been dying to see Kayla and Doug's performance today. They kind of kept it a secret for a long time, but, but we understand that they're going to be channeling their inner Carlton. Does everybody know who Carlton is? From the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air? All right. Come on, you guys. when we do this, there'll be more of you that will come and participate and show us just what God's given you. Thanks so much. <laughs> 